Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Joy Blah Blah Blah. I haven't done that yet. Okay, hold on one second. <laughs> Three, two, one. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Scale with Joy Summit. I am here with Jamie Master. She's the CEO and founder of Eventual Millionaire. It is so great to have you here, Jamie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And what's really fun is I was actually on Jamie's podcast in 2016. So we were trying, we were like bantering back and forth before this, trying to figure out like what happened since then. Did I know you had kids? What hell are your kids? Did you have kids when I was at, and like, it's, this one makes this so fun, right? Because you get to see so many of these amazing people that you connect with and reconnect with as part of series like this. So Jamie, would you mind just sharing for anyone who isn't familiar with you, you know, where you came from, how you grew into your current role and then where you are today? Well, how much time do you know? Okay, so I grew up in Maine. No, so I grew up in actually in a small town in Maine, but I've been a business coach for the last 10 years and I have a podcast where I've interviewed almost 500 millionaires that made it all through business and it's net worth millionaires. So uh, they kept the money also, not just made a bunch of money and spent it. So it's not, it's definitely based more on profit than just on gross revenue. Uh, but it's been almost 500. I wrote a book about it. We've done tons of data on it because I was obsessed when I was little that I wanted to be a millionaire. And then I realized it was more about joy than money when I had a corporate job that I absolutely hated. I made six figures at uh, 22 and hated my life. And so it sort of has been this journey of trying to figure out what brings me joy. So the name of this summit is perfect because I feel like I really help business owners that are six and seven figures scale with joy. So yeah. perfect timing, perfect summit for me to be on. So good. So as you're interviewing all these people and then creating your own business, like what were some of your big takeaways that you not only applied in your own business, but your life as well when you were learning? Well, when I first started interviewing them, I put them on a pedestal because I was 20, I was 25, 26. Yeah. I was like, well, they have some secret sauce that I don't know about. And I had actually been a business coach offline before I ever started interviewing millionaires. I had a mentor. I'd been doing it for quite a few years and super unsexy companies like plumbing companies and landscaping companies and stuff like that. Oh. And so I came from that, but I still felt like there was such a gap. And one of the things that I absolutely love is when I started interviewing millionaires, I was like, ah, oh, they make spelling mistakes too. They're, they're really bad at stuff also, right? They put in their pants one leg at a time. Yeah, what? They really, right? And, it, and it, was, it was humbling and wonderful to know that they're just humans no matter what. And so after about 10, 20 interviews at first, and I didn't think I was going to get anybody to say yes to me. Again, small town girl, I have a degree in computers. I didn't have a degree in business. Why would they say yes to me? Uh, long story short, we've got quite a few. We actually have a wait list now, which is amazing. But even only just 10 to 20 interviews in, there were patterns. Yeah. And I remember chatting with my mentor at the time going, they're saying kind of the same things. And again, it's, it's, we encompass all of business. So we can definitely talk about the personal side and a million different aspects on the business side, but some things kept coming up over and over and over again. Yeah. One of them, which sounds really cliche, but please take it with a <laughs> grain of salt, right? Is to really level up on your strengths. So one of the things uh, that a business owner has to do at the very beginning is like do everything, right? They're wearing every single hat in the business and they're just trying to do the best they can and focusing on sales really matters. But as soon as you start getting better at sales and can start getting that chunk going, um, realizing what your strengths are, I don't feel like we're taught that in school anymore. Yeah right? So trying to pull apart and I work with my uh, clients all the time and it's like, what are your strengths? Uh, well, I, I don't totally, it's hard to define some of these. So normally I'll have people run through like strengths assessments. So we have the Colby and the disc to try and figure out those kind of things. Cause a lot of the times owners and a lot of the millionaires that I've interviewed are a lot more visionary. They're yeah. a lot less detail oriented, right? And trying to sort of fit that square peg in a round hole doesn't work. And even though I used to be a project manager at that six figure job, I suck at details, like horribly yeah. bad. Oh my gosh, no, I'm an art, I paint and I, I'm vision, uh, visual, visual and visionary. So to me, you've met Leilani, my right hand. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> She's the detailed, analytical, amazing person that really complements what I have. And, and the business was able to grow massively when I got somebody that was more operations because I was trying to do stuff that was completely out of my wheelhouse, made me miserable, right? So realizing what those strengths are, number one, and then leveling up on them and finding somebody else to do, do the rest of the pieces that really make a difference in your business will be a game changer for you. Yes. It's a lot like um, 
Gina Wickman's Rocket Fuel. Exactly. At the visionary and the integrator. Yeah. Yes, yes. And a lot of people, you know, they hear that word integrator, but it's hard to like know what exactly that means. But it really is the person who is naturally good at the things that you're not as a visionary. And I think well, and so, all, we've all been there for sure. So the funny thing is, and, and it's, uh, these are all just logistics, right? But Gino's book really works with 2 million plus, right? So you can have, you know, I remember one of my clients, we hired an integrator and they're like, well, we need a lot of money. We need a C-suite salary because we're an integrator, right? Right. And like, it doesn't have to be that. It, it, it can also be an executive administrator. Like it doesn't right. have, it can be whatever the title is, but as long as it's the complementary skills, that's what matters. Because smaller businesses can't even wrap their head around, oh, I can't imagine having a huge team like this, but there's small pieces that we can put in place that will really revolutionize what you're doing, especially if you enjoy a lot more because you enjoy the strengths that you're working in, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. What are some of the other, this is so, so, so good. What are some of the other patterns that you were seeing from these successful millionaires? So one, so I came from a geeky degree in computers. I was an engineer, very science-based. So when I started um, interviewing I made them do a survey and I was like, what do you eat? Are you religious? Like I asked them all the, I was like, what patterns do we have? And there was almost no correlation of anything, which was really annoying. And in terms of like, uh, some of the people were like, I eat whatever I want, whenever I want the entrepreneur's diet. And other people were very paleo. It, it didn't, there was no correlation in any of that stuff. So I was like, paleo is not a millionaire's diet. I know. I was like, man, I wanted to know what they ate. I wanted to know. <laughs> right? I thought it was bulletproof coffee. No. Right. Seriously. That's most of them, isn't it? <laughs> Which I've tried and does not work for me, people. Anyway. Uh, but, in the morning. Uh, right? No. Uh, but when, when we're really trying to pay attention to um, what, we're, what we're working on and what we're not working on, yeah. the, the biggest thing that came up was visioning. Mm. And I thought visioning was woo-woo. And I've come a long way on the woo-woo scale, don't get me wrong. <laughs> like, but it kept coming up over and over and over again, right? And I had, I had meditated. Uh, meditation had the science behind it. So I was like, okay, I'm all in for meditation, but I don't know. This was probably 10 years ago, right? I don't know about this whole visioning thing. Um, but it was insane how much it came up. And not necessarily on the, like, I create a vision board with pictures on it, yeah. but the feeling, the feelings of what that would be when you have that level of success that kept coming up over and over and over again. And it was like a slap in the face to be like, you should be paying attention to this, Jamie, and not just poo-pooing it. It is a big deal. Does that make sense? It does. It makes a ton of sense. And what's really cool is like a lot of people see it as it can be a little new agey. It can be a little woo-woo, but quite honestly, like it's biblical too. Like yes. there's parts of the Bible that talks about, you know, where you're planting your seeds of thought. And if you are, you know, if you've been studying ancient texts, like there's, you know, it's part of the Torah talks about, you know, your intention. So it's, it's, not new, but I think sometimes in the way that it's worded, some people are just like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's like crystals and, you know, putting crystals in your bra or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which I feel like science is now catching up to a lot yeah. of the stuff. You know what I mean? Like our science was still technically new for all this stuff yeah. and it's starting to actually catch up, especially in these last 10 years to go, oh, there's actually science basis on this. So we can't just think that it's just woo woo or whatever. Cause it, if science does actually end up catching up, we're like, oh, I was dumb. Should have paid attention to that before, right? right? Should have been doing a little bit more visioning. So yeah. was it like, were they writing? Were they conceptualizing it? Was it a combination? It was a whole, it, it, depending on the person and how they were, that's how it went. So like Cameron Harold wrote a book called The Vivid Vision and his is very uh, written on a big, they have it on like their company wall and stuff like that. I don't know if you know Cameron, but he's amazing. Uh, did 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He was the operations guy. Oh, okay, there. cool. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, and he has a whole thing on operators and operations people just as, yeah. a, as a side note. He's amazing. Um, but other people were really visual. Now I paint my, I paint, so I paint my vision board. Um, oh, it really, wow. yeah, it really just depends on how you, uh, work best. Other people would actually just want to sit and actually feel the feelings and go through that. That was another guy. Um, he would do it every single morning and stand in the power yeah. pose and imagine speaking in front of however many people, right? So it just depends on what level and what flavor you want um, to make it real. But the point is to really align th what those feelings are and what you want in the future and be able to yeah. realize that you can be there now, right? In this right. moment in time. It's you huge. Choose that now. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything on like life that you felt like was a pattern that you saw? 
Life, right? So I, I personally think that uh, business uh, evolution is personal evolution, right? We bump up, we were just talking about this before, we bump yeah. up against all of our issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I highlighted from what they were saying, uh, which was huge for me, especially at the time, was, and we were just talking about this a little bit, it's yeah. the commitment to the outcome no matter what, not the yeah. how to do it. Because none of us know. And, and millionaires get it wrong a lot of the times too. Everybody gets it wrong, right? So we can't always just assume that we're going to do it the right steps each time. And we assume that we need this A to Z thinking of like, oh, but I need to know what all the steps are in order yeah. to get there. Right. Yep. Give uh, the but perfect it, answer. Yes. Because I don't want to screw I, it up. That's how we grew up, right? It's like, yes. get the A. Well, I was also a straight A student, so I was like, and then I'm perfect, goody two shoes, right? Yeah, yeah, which probably means we didn't make enough mistakes. Like we took the classes we knew we could nail, right? In retrospect, you know, I did, I graduated valedictorian and all that too. And like now in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I took the classes I knew I could do really well in. So, um, I played so the game. Well, I get, so what's amazing about playing the game is like, go, you, you got a good job and now everybody thinks you're great, right? right. So, so they thought, and then you get in the real world and you're like, oh, what rules? I can do whatever I want, right? Right. And, and it's and you can have so much more success and so much more internal joy because of that instead of just playing the game like a robot on what we're doing. So it's a funny side note, but my children go to an entrepreneur kids school now. Oh wow. Yeah. And there's no grades and there's no homework and they don't have teachers and they only have guides. There's not even any desks. So they have to learn uh -huh. how to work on their own. So they're teaching them this commitment to the outcome. They just need to get a certain number of checks. They have to do like a, a TED talk style thing and blah, 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 but they can decide when they do it, how they do it, where they do it, all that. I'm like, I can only imagine be, having that much freedom to know, just bringing it back to the strengths. Like my kids are starting to understand at such an early age what their strengths are. Mm -hmm. Right, whether they can actually level it up later, and it's so cool to be able to see the, pro the the faster progress instead of just playing the game, which is what they were doing before in the school before that. That's so cool. What made you decide to move them? So, well, a couple of things. So, again, being from the middle of nowhere in Maine, uh, I grew up in a town of like two thousand people. Yeah, thank goodness we have the internet. <laughs> thank goodness, because I was interviewing millionaires there. But oh, wow. we were very. Um, it was a very small pond <laughs> that we were in, right? And so uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was travel with them more and we weren't allowed to. Like I couldn't take them out of school for a certain amount of time. I wasn't allowed to. I'd get yeah. in trouble as a parent, which is kind of silly, right? Yeah. Um, so I tried looking for schools in Maine and there were none. So one of the reasons why I moved to Austin is the only thing I could think of was either have somebody actually um, tutor my kids so that I could travel with them constantly, but that seemed a little crazy, or move. And we ended up moving to Austin because they have so many more schools like this here than in anywhere else. Yeah, it's really, really it's cool to, to make to expand your children's horizon. Like my kids are in the traditional public school where you do get your hand slapped if you know you they out for a certain number of days. And like I am kind of I've been thinking it's really interesting that you say mm. this. This is the off topic from scaling, but I think mm -hmm. it probably a lot of people relate to it because I've really been thinking as an entrepreneur, like how do I want how do I want to teach my kids about how the system works? Like, I don't want them to be afraid to, to fail. I don't want them to be afraid to get the F. I, I want them to be able to be like, cool, I got the F. Like, let's figure out what this means. Let's look at the answers. Instead of feeling like you have to hide it. And already in the school, even though they're young, you, you already see it. You know, you already see the like, don't make a mistake. Don't fail. You see, um, you see teachers acting, you know, gossipy, you, you know, there's things that you're just like, okay, like I'm going to have to teach them that this yeah. is not the end, the end all be all. Yes. Like we almost got kicked out of school because we shaved their hair. Like, and it, and it was inappropriate. I was like, wait, what? Like there's anyway, side note, but, no, but it's cool. Cause I wonder how many other entrepreneurs are watching this being like, oh my gosh. Like I thought, I thought it was me. Like, because I look around at the other parents in the school and they're all like cool with it. And it's one of the best elementary schools in the whole state. But I, there's a the part of me that's kind of like, I hope yep. I'm teaching them the right things here. Well, like, so, and I then, hope, I hope we're, I hope we're teaching them to, to fail. And it was interesting because do you ever listen to Brooke Castillo? Oh no, I haven't. Okay. So she's an amazing life coach. She's oh yes, Dallas. Actually, yes, yes, yes. Yes. And she interviewed her sons on her podcast recently. And it was very inspiring to me because she was kind of like, I teach them how to play the game. Yeah. I don't agree with the game. They know I don't agree with the game. They're straight yeah. A students, but like, I teach them that like, this is not, you know, like, like this is not where you're going to learn everything about what you need to know. This is like, you got to follow their rules because it's their rules. 
and like, you know, then you can make your own rules. And I was like, okay, cool. Like that's, that's going to be my motherhood message, I think. Well, it's, it's hard, especially as a parent to try and do a, we're going to screw them up somehow, <laughs> right? Like probably in some way or another, no matter how good of a job we're trying to do. Uh, but B, really making sure that we're setting them up so that our values are really with them. So my daughter used to listen, she's probably actually listened to the show that we did together. She listens to my podcast every single night to fall asleep which I was like, yes, right? Yes. Ingrained it in her head and yet still had such issues with failure. She has ADHD. I have ADHD. I, there's just all these things, right? And, and the fact that we're actually working on them and when she's 10, she's 10, working yeah. on them now when she's 10, I'm like, I can't even imagine being a business owner and having even just partial business skills. Like my son has made so much money in the school that they have. Um, they're allowed to make money. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. They have a school Super store. Cool. He made a, a tournament and, and cards and he's made a hundred, 150 real dollars in it. I, now he won't like make his bed because I don't pay him enough, like all sorts of pain on the butt <laughs> stuff, which I'm very proud of, but it's very annoying. They're learning way too many things. Uh, <laughs> but, but isn't that crazy? It's the opposite. I'm like, wow, now they're surpassing. I do this for a living. I charge 1500 an hour to coach people on this stuff. And my kids are coming around and, and having better ideas. I'm like trying to give them business advice. And my son's like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm like, that's actually way better than the plan that I just had. So, I mean, I don't I mean, know about this. Like, they're probably going to school you at a certain point. I'm, and I will, I will soak it all up. I will be a beginner's mind. Like, it's just the level uh, that they have of openness to what's possible instead of yes. like you're talking about being a business owner, especially if you've been a business owner a while, the previous things that you've been through, oh, this was hard. This sucked, right? It, it emotionally sets up with beliefs that yes. we kind of have to get through, right? Like last time I did that, it was exhausting or whatever the things are that we have in our brain. Yeah. That Everything will stop you. Is. Yeah. Can you imagine being a kid and not having those stories and being like, oh. my son went knocking door to door last week, uh, door to door. Didn't want my help either. I was like, I can help you. He's like, no, I'm good. He's 12. And, and he went door to door and did pressure washing. He made 85 bucks in three hours, which That's is like, amazing. Cause you and I probably coach people that don't want to make phone calls. Right. Right. And so um, because the stories, right? Like, I don't want to make a phone call. So what if they say no? And I don't nope. know if I'm good enough. And like, it is amazing how we need to learn that, how we learn that and then really get to a certain point in life where you just choose to unlearn it. Um, that's, that's a huge piece though. Like what you were saying, um, from the millionaires, it's like, everybody's going to run up against some sort of wall and each mm -hmm. wall is a little bit different. And that's the thing that's really hard with the cookie cutter approach to anything. That's why I started interviewing millionaires. I was like, well, the people that write books are great, but what are the people that have the weirdo unsexy businesses, yes. right? That aren't writing books about how the nitty gritty actually works, like what systems are actually working. So I'm a geek. So I'm asking a million detailed questions about how they run everything, right? Tech wise, as OP wise, all that stuff. And so we can start to pull out the thing, but either way, it's the, the catalysts that are diff that are, that happen to each person are completely different in whatever the changes are. Right. So we can right. try and pretend, and we're not all special snowflakes, quote unquote. Right. right. <laughs> but we all, but we all have our own issues and yeah. not being able to have anybody tell you what your issues are. You are the on only owner of your own, um, evolutional growth, right? So if you're like, oh, I don't know what my strengths are. Who can tell me my strengths? We have a tendency to look outside of ourselves so much. Well, then that guru has the answer. Well, that, yeah. right? But that guru has totally different beliefs and mindset. Yeah. Maybe they have other issues, which is fine, but, but it's totally different. And so we're on this journey technically alone with help, of course, and support, um, especially if you're feeling lonely. But trying to figure out what's, what that is, is typically going more inward than even feels comfortable. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what did you find about the millionaires that like, did they, did they hiccup at a certain point when they were going inward or did they go inward and like move through it? Like what, what got them on the other side of it? Do you think? <laughs> Pain. <Did> yeah. <laughs> so they're also really stubborn. I, I was just literally on, stubborn and uh, I had a, I had a handful of calls and we were uh, uh, interviews that I just did. And I was like, why, why does it always seem like the catalyst has to be some major pain, right? Can't we just make it be a little bit easier than what that is? Uh, but most of the time it was, it was painful. It was, I was holding on too tight and then this happened, or I took too big of a risk and this happened, or, or even uh, we were talking about the catalysts of, um, I had a son, so I didn't quit my day job until, until it was something outside of me that made me do it. Even though I knew I didn't want to do that day job, right? 
And so a lot of the times it's some sort of outside catalyst or outside pain that makes them go, oh, I should probably do something and change something. Because because we can handle so much pain, typically, entrepreneurs are really good at handling pain. And yeah, they have a high pain threshold. Yeah, which yeah. is not good, people. I know That's we're like really pretending that it's amazing. Like, go oh, me, I can hustle for 27 hours straight. Oh, yeah. and then I die a little or die early, yeah. right? called, yeah, chronic fatigue. Yes. And I just start, yeah, healing over. Yeah. But, but part of the system is that we, we are rewarded for, I'm an overachiever. Yay. Pat me on the head. I, I did it. Yay. Right. right. And so it's sort of turning that on its head. And the only way that, and, and again, through countless millionaire interviews, it's like, oh, and then this happened and then I had to change. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. Most of them, the other very common thing was that they invest in themselves anyway, because they do know that investing personally uh, makes a difference in business. And that's something that I've found over and over and over from millionaires that I've, inter both that I've interviewed, but also that I've coached, they bump up against stuff too. And you're like, oh, that's a belief. That's something, sometimes we need therapy. Sometimes we, there's yeah. just a million different modalities that you sometimes can We choose. need wine. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sometimes we have too much wine and I have to call that piece out too, right? But, right? So, so everybody's got their own chunks of things and it's literally just trying to uncover more about yourself so that you know. And even, even when you know what the issues are, sometimes that's not enough. We need the catalyst or the pain or the whatever it is to sort of put in our face to actually take action on that too. And so on the other side of whatever that painful thing is, like whatever they, they experienced loss around or whatever they were doing, um, you know, buffering around with you know, whatever, drinking social media, whatever, right? Where they realize I've got to figure out how to break through this. Do you find that that has paralleled to their business growth? I know it has for me, but, uh, yeah. but yes, for, so it's, so it depends. It depends on if it's a, a deep seated belief. This is from my coaching. If it's a deep seated belief, I mean, that can revolutionize even just the action that you're taking because of that, not only the mindset and the way that you're thinking, Right. But it's like, oh, now I can just do more. I can take the, the more out of my comfort zone actions, like even just simple as cold calling. And you can make a cold call and be like, oh, I just got another huge sale. Right. Or whatever those pieces are. Those things really, really add up. But it's not always like that either. I guess I, I care about statistically significant, too. So all the, when I go back through everything, I'm like, nah. I mean, each person does their own sort of level of, of what they need at the time. And it, I, I wish it was like, hey, fix this in personal life, business is great, right? Yeah. Not always like that. Uh, but it definitely does align. As a, as a business coach, I, I'm literally coaching people on their lives because if they're having issues with their uh, wives or husbands or whatever it is, yeah. that shows up everywhere. I mean, I was chatting with somebody the other day, uh, not a client, but a prospect, and he was feeling, wanted, he wanted more power in his business, right? He had a really successful multi-million dollar business, but he wants an office that he can walk in and show people and stuff like that. And I started asking about his personal life and it was like, oh, you don't feel like you have power in your personal life. So good to know. So we're going to put this whole thing. He doesn't need an office. He's no, doing he's really an office. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've heard people say <laughs> that too, like, I'm going to have an office so that like I can, I'm like, not good enough reason. So, what, right? It's like, oh, that's, that's just a need that needs to be satisfied somewhere else. So why don't we get to the root of what that core issue is? So that way we don't have to go and put up a little facade that probably won't be fulfilling anyway, because the core thing is still there. Right? So it's trying oh, yeah. to pull those pieces apart. Well, I love what you're saying, because this is actually a very, very good point, And it's a small point. It has to do with money right? Mm -hmm. Is that what we believe about ourselves usually shows up in our bank account. And so if you're overspending on an office because you think it'll give you significance, yeah. then that's just money that you could have put into retirement or that you could have put into your savings or just, um, just to enjoy, just to see some zeros in your bank account. Like you just go, woo -woo, you know, like that you take away that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is really cool. Like how I was, I was really curious about how the mindset showed up in actually like tangible business decisions, but that's a great example. Mm, it's great. It's funny too, because we assume that it's just, oh, it's a strategic move because I'm going to, and we have all the quote unquote excuses in the world when it Justify comes to anything. that stuff. So exactly. Yeah. We're so smart. We, this is why We're I'm really scared about my children. Yeah. My children can justify anything. Anything, so right? Very impressive. So, but when you, when you look at it that way, it's so much easier being an outsider looking in because it's harder for me to do it on my own too. I, I, it's hard for me to call myself out on myself, right? Because it, it feels unsafe or whatever those things are. And so it is great to have somebody else sort of look at that and be like, hmm, wait, why are you doing that exactly? Yeah. Yeah. It's great to have that mirror. So, um, 
anything else that you want to share? This is so awesome. And I know people are going to want to connect with you, which they can do in our Facebook group after this interview. Um, but anything else that you like last tidbits or pieces of wisdom that you wanted to share around what you've learned from your building your own business and interviewing so many millionaires? Yes. So one thing that I do with every single one of my clients, we call it the speed of implementation. Um, the other thing is that the feedback loop of implementation, getting feedback and then changing and tweaking what you're doing yeah. really matters. So the faster you can do that, usually the faster results you can see, right? Because you yeah. can tweak based on the data that you have. Now, doing it as a solopreneur is very different than doing it with a team. Teams, you can usually move a lot faster um, because yeah. you've got other people on your team. But to me, it all starts with uh, going through a time audit and everybody hates me. I'm going to give this for free for everybody. Again, it goes, it's every single one of my clients that I, I make, I make them do it. Yep. Like, you will hate me. I know you'll hate me. You'll love me later. Um, but taking three to five days of literally within minutes of how much you're doing and categorizing it. Right. Then within that sheet, cause I'm going to give this all for free without even an opt-in people, just so you know, I'm not, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. just the videos so that you can get them. It talks about flow. So when we started talking about the strengths, there's a whole subsection on strengths. Great. I now kind of know what my strengths are. What do I do with it? Right. And, and the whole point is to try and get in flow more so that we can make that speed of implementation even faster. So even if you're a solopreneur, you can go, Ooh, I know that when I'm writing at whatever clock in the morning it is, I can get into flow faster and I can create way more. There's tons of data on this too, from a book called mm -hmm. stealing fire by Jamie wheel. Um, but I can get way more done in the same amount of time. And that's that speed of implementation gap closing a little bit more. So I just highly, highly recommend anybody hate me for a little while, do the time audit, pull that back and really understand what those strengths are. So that way you can level them up. That's what's going to move your business forward, both on the revenue side, but also on the less stress side, because you're going to be doing a lot more of the stuff that you want to be doing. I've used this as a, like a, um, an employee management tool too. Yeah. Like when your employees come to you, especially because I had, there was a time where I had multiple like brick and mortar locations. So you'd have a manager being like, I'm here until eight o'clock at night. And I'm like, why? You know? So like, so, okay, thank you for letting me know. Can you just, here's a little time audit sheet, like fill it out for a week and let's take a look at it and see where we're spending your time. And then all of a sudden, you know, it puts the responsibility back on them and they're man how they're managing their time. Because now you're not this big bad boss that's like making them work all these hours. Now they have to really think about like, well, like how many chit chats did I have today that's causing me to stay until eight o'clock at night? So it's great to do on yourself. And then when you learn how to do it from Jamie, great to do on your team. <laughs> When you feel like, and then you can genuinely say like, oh my gosh, yes, they do have a 60 hours worth of work to do in a 40 hour work week. I need to hire someone. That's so. exactly what we use it for. Exactly yeah. what we use it for. So being able to know and have the visibility. Because the other thing is, is that owners go, I, I do seven hours of email. It feels like so much, right? And then you actually do it and they're like, oh, it was maybe an hour a week. An hour. And, and I, it and feels it like it's forever, right? You know, it's funny how we create our own drama, right? Yes. And then once we can kind of get out of our own heads and, and really see ourselves almost as if we're watching someone else, like mm -hmm. that is something that I think is a great skill that entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs tend to develop, right? And then, um, and then you can really just be like, okay, I don't really need to have my email open all day long. Like, good point, you know? Easier said than done, though. I know. I'll admit it. No. I mean, so, but our brains also, I think the, the data is like 50% of our memories are not actually accurate, right? Yes. <laughs> so when you're like, oh, I, last, last time I did this launch, it didn't go very well. And you look, I have my clients look at the numbers and I'm like, that went pretty good. Don't really know why you put that spin on it, right? Because we put our perceptions on whatever it is that we're doing. And so if we can sort of get back out from that and look at just the data and be like, oh, no, this is just the data here. Um, it's a lot easier to see the forest for the trees in your own business. It's way easier if it's looking at somebody else's business. You can always, you're not always, but most of the time see their own stuff, right? Yeah. A numbers don't lie. Yeah, exactly. Our feelings do, but numbers tend not to. Yeah. Well, and what's tough about the feeling side too is that it's all perception though. So you don't want to negate somebody's feelings either, right? Because that doesn't work well, especially on the team, right? When, when you're dealing with so many sticky situations and culture and fit and all sorts of stuff like that, it's like, oh, if I could just measure this, this would be so much easier. But now I have to deal with how you feel. No. Uh, but, but caring about that really does make a big difference. And that thankfully that we live in a world that is so full of Sometimes it's not good, but so full of information that yes. if you have a question, you can figure it out for pretty much anything nowadays. Exactly. So thank goodness we live in the world that we do now. 
Yes. And that's where connection comes in. So as you were saying, like having empathy, being like, okay, I totally don't want you working that much. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Now let's take a look at the data together. Um, it's so good. So this is awesome, Jamie. This is such a great interview and um, you are a wealth of information. So if you want to learn more from Jamie, you're going to find out some great ways to do that underneath this video. She's also going to link right to the show notes. So any books that she recommended like a book and mentioned a couple of people, she'll put that information right in there so that you can um, take a look and she has some great, great bonuses to share with you. So make sure that you check it out. Yes. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. We'll put all that speed of implementation and all that fun stuff on that link so everyone can take a look. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you again.